And Hoda, he, uh, many of you know this already, but it's, it's just incredible. She's covered a wide variety of domestic and international stories across all NBC news platforms. She's covered Hurricane Katrina, the war in Iraq, the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, the war on terror in Afghanistan, and she conducted an exclusive interview with Aung San Suu Kyi, an internationally recognized leader of Burma, marking the first time in 11 years that she had been interviewed by an American television network. Um, other amazing things. She uh, also covered the devastating effects of the tsunami, went to war-torn Burma, led, a, led secretly by rebel soldiers to report a complete story on the 12-year-old twin warriors who were said to have magical powers. I got to hear that story. That's, um, that's amazing. And very importantly, she's a five-year survivor of breast cancer and has been part of several initiatives to raise awareness about the disease. She has received numerous awards, graduated from Virginia Tech with a bachelor's in broadcast journalism, and she resides in New York, and we get to see her, which is even more incredible. So help me welcome Hoda. How are you? All right, I think we should begin by talking about Kathy Lee's drinking problem. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm the one with the drinking problem. Okay, let me start off because since we taped our show today, which is why I was able to jet set here, I want to take a couple of quick pictures of you so we can show them on Monday. Okay, smile. Okay. All right. Most of you will be happy with that one. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, one over here. And one last one right here. Okay. Oh, yes, I got you waving. You're in it. You look good. You guys, thank you. This means so much, by the way, that you guys all came out today. It was snowy, and it's one of those days, but I just want to, first of all, just say thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this book I am so excited about, and it's one of those books that you think to yourself, I'm so glad that our publisher brought this idea to us. This is one of those things that you've all been on the front end of something scary. You've gotten a bad diagnosis, you know, you've gone to the doctor and he told you bad news, or your boss said, hey, come in, I need to talk to you, and you got some terrible news from him. So you're thinking to yourself, like, how am I going to make it 10 minutes, let alone 10 years? The people in this book are so phenomenal, they each should have written their own book. I mean, that's how cool they are. And I'll just tell you about a couple of them. One of them is named Amy Barnes. And Amy is this woman, she weighed 500 pounds. She was in a terribly abusive relationship and had a couple of kids. And like a lot of people, she just felt really trapped, like there was no way out. And she didn't know what to do, and one day, he, I guess her boyfriend beat her so badly, she said, that her young son walked in the bathroom, saw her on the ground um, with blood on her face. He wiped the blood away and said, Mommy, I want you to be pretty again. Um, she felt like she couldn't get out of this horrible relationship. And I'll fast forward through the story so you guys can read it, but at the end, you will see that Amy Barnes looks smoking hot, first of all. She lost all that weight. It looked like uh, just a joy fit. But what she realized after is how she changed on the inside was astonishing. She got her self-esteem back, and she did it for her kids. And I think when you read this book, you'll say, you know what, if she can do that, I can do this. You know, whatever your this is, you'll read these, these people's stories and think, my God, I can definitely do this. One of my favorite ones is this woman in the back of the book named Roxanne Quimby. Roxanne's dad went to Harvard, and all of her brothers and sisters did, and they were all smarty pants, and she wasn't. She just kind of, she did a little bit of schooling, and then she went to go live in the woods with her boyfriend, and she was the black sheep kind of weirdo of the family. And she had some kids and stuff, and her husband ended up leaving her. Okay, so now she's out of luck. She's got kids, and she just got fired from her third waitressing job. Okay, so she's in Maine. And she sees kind of a scary looking guy in a lawn chair sitting on the side of the road with a scruffy beard, um, looks like a lumberjack kind of guy. And next to him is a table with a pickle jar full of honey. And she says, what is that? He says, it's honey. She says, what are you doing with it? He says, I have some beehives and I sell honey. And she said, no one is buying honey 
that looks like that. It looks awful. And she says, let me ask you this. If I help you package it, will you let me have a cut? He said, have at it. You know, I don't care. I live in that little house. It's paid for. You know, he's just doing it for fun. So she starts packaging the honey, and people like it. They start buying it right there on the roadside stand. Then they sell it at festivals and fairs, and it's really catching fire. She says, what do you do with the wax? He said, I put the wax in that shed over there. So she says, I, can I make some candles with that wax? He says, you know, look, have at it. I don't care. So she goes to a candle store and she watches how people buy candles. They pick up the candle, look at the bottom, and put it down. So she said, wow, I don't know why people do that, but I'm gonna make the bottom look as beautiful as the top. So she made beautiful candles and people were buying them like hotcakes. She was like, wow, this is unbelievable. She said <clears throat> to this guy, we've gotta think of a name for our company. So she goes back to where his hives are and he's, you know, he's always like trying to hide everything and he has a weird handwritten sign up there and the sign says, Burt's Bees. She says, Burt's Bees. Let's call it Burt's Bees. She put his, you, you know the ugly guy on the cover of all the chapstick? That's Burt. That's the weird guy who she saw on the side of the road. That company exploded, okay? She sold it for $350 million. Her dad, snotty Harvard, was looking through the Harvard Business Review. He was not speaking to his daughter. And who did he see? but his daughter as a business success story. So I said, tell me what happened. I expected her to say the angel sang and we hugged and he cried. It never really works out like that. Anyway, so she said, she said, dad, you know, I did this. And he said, I'm, he said, good for you. And I said, are you upset that it wasn't more of a moment? Like, and she said, no, I'll tell you why. And she said, the way my dad treated me throughout my life was what propelled me. She said, I promise you, I would have never found that company if it hadn't have been for the way my father had treated me. It's almost like, you know you're not gonna get an atta girl, so you keep pushing. A lot of women who are successful have that somewhere. Julia Roberts, I saw in an interview, said her dad passed away when she was younger, and he never got to say, you did good, Julia. So she kept pushing. So whatever your motivating force is, so she thanks him. She doesn't walk around like with bitterness and that jerk. No, she, she, um, she embraces him. And I think the funny thing about all the people in this book is they didn't do it for themselves. They didn't overcome the big hurdle for themselves. They did it for somebody else, for their kids or their parents and stuff. And I remember, um, I don't remember when it was, a long time ago, I made a bad decision and I ran a marathon and I, didn't, I was in the back. I was in the way back with all of the, you know, you know who was back there. Anyway, so I'm in the back and at the last eighth of a mile, at the end of the marathon, everybody runs because you don't want to walk across the finish line you want to run so no matter what you've been through you run at the end so people had signs you know special t-shirts made and one said this is for my wife a guy had it i could see it and it had his her birth date and look pat her death date and another woman had one that said this is from you know had her son's name and he had died young and she was running and there was a guy that had this is for my friends at vietnam and he was running and there was only one person walking at the end. And on the back of her shirt, it said, this one's for me. And I thought, you know what? It's so hard to do something huge for yourself. It's the reason people can pick a car off of a person who's trapped under it. But the reason if someone asked you to do it right now, you know, for yourself, you could never do it. So I think you learn that. And the other thing they did was they took the spotlight off themselves. And this, um, this guy told me a story once, my ex-husband, but <laughs> that's <laughs> irrelevant, <laughs> irrelevant to the story. He did do one good thing, he gave me this story. Um, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, <laughs> sort of. Anyway, so, my, uh, so he told the story of a relative of his, and it starts off as a very kind of tragic story. It was a young girl, she was in a terrible accident, and she lost the use of her legs, and she was devastated. She was, I think, nine or 10, and she was in a hospital, and she was, obviously devastated and her parents were devastated and um, the doctor said I think you need to put your daughter in a room with with other kids because she's isolated she wanted her own room so the parents went to the little girl and said honey the doctor wants you in with the other kids and she said no I don't want to be in with the other kids so they said she doesn't want it just you know let her do what she wants she's feeling awful we're feeling awful let her be alone the doctor came back a couple of days later look you really have to put her in with the other kids I'm telling you it'll be the best for her so ultimately they sort of, <laughs> excuse me, push her along and she's in a room with another kid. The wheelchair is parked next to her bed. She's, she's you know, just in, terrible, in a terrible state. 
the kid next to her says, excuse me, in the bed next to her, can you help me? And she looks over at him and she says, he says, can you push this button for the nurse? I can't push it. And she said, how do you expect me to push that button? You know, I lost the use of my legs. And the, the kid said, uh, I lost the use of my arms and my legs. She, this makes me cry every time, she lifted herself up out of her bed and hoisted herself into that wheelchair and wheeled over and pushed the button for that kid. This young girl grew up to be an attorney, okay? And she's fighting for the disabled and for the, the rights of the, dis, the disabled. She took her terrible moment. She could have been in the fetal position. I mean, she could have spent her life saying, I got the worst hand ever. But she's not like that. When you meet her, I mean, she's, she's a light. She's lit from inside, you know those people? And it made me think, like, if the spotlight's not on you, you can do great things. All of these people in the book could have, you know, just jumped off the balcony, but they all ended up doing something incredible. <laughs> and when you meet them and read about them, I think you'll, I think you'll, you'll, you'll see that and you'll feel that. But, and, and you know, I, I'm five years cancer free and I was wondering, you know, we weren't sure whether to do five years or 10 years. We decided to do 10 because it takes a lot of time for a lesson to really come out. But I do have to say, um, after five years, you do learn a couple of things. And I remember <clears throat> after my breast cancer surgery and stuff, and I remember it was such a weird epiphany. And I don't know if you guys, whatever you've been through in your life, divorce or cancer, whatever it is, whatever your cross to bear is, if you're still standing at the end, even if you're teetery and you don't feel good, but if you're still standing, I think you get four words. You get, you can't scare me. And I remember it hit me one day, like just like a bolt of lightning. And I did something I'd never done in my life before. I was a hard worker at work and I always did everything right, but I always waited to be noticed, you know? I would like work hard in the front row and expect them to say, you're getting a promotion, you know? And, and I never asked for anything because I didn't feel confident, I guess, to ask. And I remember after that moment, I said, you know what? <clears throat> I'm gonna do something I've never done before. I'm going up to the 52nd floor and I'm gonna go ask for this job. I heard there's a new hour of the Today Show starting. I hit 52 in the elevator bank where all the big wigs sit. And I remember how calm I felt all the way up in that, you know, normally my heart would have been pounding, my hands would have been sweaty. I was so calm because it seemed so nothing, like so little to ask for that. And so I went in and I saw Jeff Zucker and I was like, hey, you can't scare me. He was like, it's crazy. <laughs> Whatever, I don't care, I did it, you know, I did it. And I walked out of there, I was like, I don't think, I think I'm nuts, but I did it. And with the help of some producers and other people, I ended up getting this job with Kathy Lee. And I thought, you know what, if I hadn't been sick and gotten better and gotten confidence, I'm sure I would have never had this job. I wouldn't have, I would have never asked, ever. So sometimes, <laughs> like the people in the book, the tragedy you have in your life it sometimes just changes your world in a way you could have never expected. And you think it's the worst thing in your life and it turns out to be, you know, your shining light kind of thing. Okay, now we can talk about Kathy's drinking problem. All right, <laughs> I'm kidding. Do you guys have questions? I'd rather uh, answer your questions and, you know, because feel free. Don't, oh, there you are. Well, how did the whole drinking thing? How did the drinking thing? I knew we were going there. Um, here's how it started, so it's not our fault. I'm just telling you. Chelsea Handler was on our show one day, and she wrote the book, <clears throat> excuse me, Hello Vodka, It's Me, Chelsea. So we thought, wouldn't it be funny if we gave her a drink on the show? Ha ha, here's your drink. And that was it. So a couple of days later, Brooke Shields was on, and she said, where's mine? And we said, where's your what? We didn't even know what she was talking about. The drink. You know, I saw that you gave Chelsea one, so we're like, oh, okay. So we got her wine, and then pretty soon our floor director became the bartender, and the whole show just went off the rails. I mean, it just, <laughs> Time Magazine called us the happy hour of today, and we just sort of, we sort of stuck with it. And then we thought, you know, look, we sip a little. I mean, we don't, we don't, we don't drink a lot. At least I don't. But, you know, I mean, I, <laughs> you know, I'm teasing. I love Kathy Lee. I think she is like one of these people. She taught me how to like, I was, I was in hard news my whole life. You know, I had tight news corset. You know, it was always camera one, camera two, camera one, camera two. I just wanted to do it right. And one day, I had the earpiece in, the producers are talking, Kathy Lee sitting next to me, and I have the cards. I'm the only one who knows, like, what's happening next. And Kathy Lee looks, looks at me, and she goes, and she goes, I'm right here. She said in the sh during the show, I go, I looked at her, she goes, I'm right here. And I remember, because I'm so busy worrying about what's next. <laughs> and she said, do me a favor get rid of those cards. And I was like, 
get rid of the cards. Nobody knows what's going on except me. <laughs> and she goes, please. And I remember I tossed the cards up and they just, I was watching them fall on the floor. I was like, that's the end of this thing. And for the first time, I listened to her. I looked at her and I listened to her and we talked. And so what if we mess up the commercial break? And so what? And so what? And she's right. If it's real and authentic, it doesn't matter if you're following the rules. So she sort of taught me to, you know, let my hair down. So, sort of, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Feel free. Yes, Denny. Uh, tell me why, uh, before you started sketching the show, uh, why you went into these terrifying areas of the world to report? What was it inside you that drove you to take such a uh, inordinate risk? I d you know what? I think when you're doing those kind of shoots and things, you don't really think of the risk. I didn't, because I didn't feel... I, I wasn't scared because I didn't know what, what that kind of pain would have been like. So I think when they said, oh, you're going to Burma and you have to sneak around and we had to dress up, me and my producer, like housewives on a silk buying trip. Because interviewing this woman in Burma, she was the elected leader of Burma, it was illegal and you were gonna be thrown in, in prison uh, for seven years and there was no US embassy. So we were sneaking around all dressed up with heels on and they worked it out so in the heel of the shoe, you could smuggle out a tape. So we would shoot it and we were gonna stick the tape in our shoes. So we do this interview, I'm, ter I'm terrified. And I was so worried about getting out and not going to prison that when she was talking, I was totally tuning out. I was like, oh my God, no, be here now. But you know when you really think that the thing outside the military is waiting for you, it's hard to be here now. It's one of the lessons I learned from doing that interview. But after we were finished with it, I peeked out the window and there were military vehicles circling because it was a military parade day, so they were everywhere. And my, one of the fixers said, we got you covered, don't worry. So they had a decoy car. So some people jumped in a decoy car and sped off and a military vehicle tailed them. And another, another group of people jumped into another car and the military vehicle tailed them. So there were four decoys and we were in the last car. So we're slumped in the back seat and I'm looking at the rear view mirror and my heart is just like pounding. Because you know, I was at Saks buying shoes two days ago. I mean, I couldn't even believe I was there. You know, it's like a weird feeling. And as we're driving off, I don't see any military vehicles behind us. So we get to the airport and I see these old, clunky, uh, those screening things, you know, that you walk through. They're just the old fashioned kind. And I don't know if the tapes have metal in them or what's gonna happen when you go through. I remember I took a giant, I looked at that thing, I took a giant step. You know when you try to step through the thing so you're healed? I took a giant step through and my producer was behind me and the thing didn't go off and I looked at her and she goes, you wait for me. She was mouthing, I'm like, I'm waiting. <laughs> she stepped through too. We got on that plane, we ended up going, I think, to, I don't, went to, to Thailand first. We, I mean, I don't want to talk about drinking again, but we had so many drinks because we were so happy that we made it out of there okay. But at the time, you're not thinking about, you're a little bit thinking about the, the, the scariness. Or, you know, we were there after the, the statue fell in, in Iraq, and it was scary. It was like the Wild West. I mean, people were, it got hairy a lot of times. And I think, you know, you just sort of put your head in another place for me. I mean, look, I'm not like those guys, Richard Engel, and all the guys who really are on the front lines. They, kn they know the real stuff. I sort of parachute in and parachute out, so I've probably been there a dozen times or so. But, I mean, in retrospect, like, what was I thinking, you know? <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, a couple of them I had met on Dateline shoots, so I knew them from there. We looked through all the, the, the Dateline people, and some of them we found, <laughs> excuse me, through word of mouth, uh, people told, sometimes I was Googling. I mean, I was just, we wanted six exceptional stories. Thank you so much. Danny, you're always thinking, thank you. So we, we found these six people, and they were, I mean, they're, they're, they're to me, they're all spectacular. And it was fun finding them. The process was fun, doing the interviews and stuff. Yes, does someone have one over here? No? Yes. Yes. Hi. So who are you? Uh-huh. What perspective or what technique do you use to connect with just about anybody that you're interviewing? Um, I think look, if you're the kind <laughs> excuse me, if you're the kind of person who your friends come to to tell their problems to, you're probably a good reporter because there's something innate, I think, in certain people, and I bet you this room's full of them. Like, I bet you there are uh, uh, dozens of people in this room who would be good reporters because you're good at listening. And I think people sense when you're 
listening and when you care about what they're, they're talking about. I think often the reporter tries to make him or herself the story. You know, they want to grandstand and be like, you know, they want, they want to ask the question. They want, it, you know, they want it to be about them. And I think, especially when you're covering like a hurricane or you have a short period of time where you just meet someone. And I think, you know, look, I don't know that I, do, <laughs> that I always do it right because I'm a journalist, but sometimes I feel like when I'm on one of those scenes, I wish I were the Red Cross and not a journalist. You know, you want to you help. Like you're standing there looking at this devastation and you're writing it on a notepad. Like sometimes you go like, what am I doing? So I think when you feel that inside you, I think people probably understand that you're there for more than just the, did I get my scoop or, or whatever, the way people do it, I think. I think that's probably it. Take one more. Yes, hi, hon. Yes. And I knew you were going to be here. Yes. So I'm looking at your dress. I'm off. How much are you going to get? You're supposed to be there at 11.30. Exactly. You're wearing the exact same I know. Don't remind me. Okay. Here's the problem. Here's the problem with the dress. I packed another one, and some stuff in my luggage fell out on it. So I was like, do I have another dress? And then I remembered the one I traveled in. So I, yes, I still have the same dress on. Did you tape, or was that live? Are you normally live? Or do you have <laughs> We always do live. On Fridays, we started taping because you see our Friday show is kind of like a party show. It's fun. It doesn't really. So I, we tape two Thursday, and we usually get a long weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. <laughs> it's, the be it's really the best. It's, it's really great. So that's usually our, our Friday shows are taped. Sometimes we do them live. Yes? Are you talking about our show? <laughs> just checking, just checking, just checking. Okay, I'm ready. And um, to answer your opinion, um, what is something that like, keeps you up at night? Things that worry me, you mean? You mean about the, about the, about the country? Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, I was not expecting this kind of question. Um, I just, you know, sometimes in day-to-day -day life, and this sounds like a small thing, but I think it's a bigger thing, like, and maybe it's sometimes it's New York. I like people who are really kind and courteous. And I know it's small, but the way we treat each other, I think sometimes is, is, is not great. And there are times when I hold the door for someone and they go blasting through and they don't say anything, or there are times when they're all small things. And look, I love reality TV, I watch it. But at the same time, I think like, what is this? Like, what is going on? And I feel like, like we watch women fight on reality TV shows and so I think it somehow influences and impacts how we live our lives. And I just wish, you know, I mean, to be Pollyanna, I wish people were kinder. I mean, sometimes you, you see the world through your own lens, you know, and I try to surround myself with the, with the people who lift me up and not with the, the ones who don't. And I try to catch myself. You know, it took me a while to get adjusted to New York cabs and other things, you know, when they would go, where are you going? I'm like, couldn't you ask nicely? Like, hi, where are you going? But you, you learn. But I, I just wish, I think, in, in that world that I, I wish people were a little bit nicer to one another. Any more real quick? Denny. Denny, Denny. You know, that's the problem with reading your bio, and I'm the Yeah. That was one of those weird stories. It was on the front cover of the New York Times, okay? And they said there were two twins that had magical powers that, I know, that's what I thought. No, but everybody believed it. It was, come on, it was in the Times. We're like, so they hand us the Times, go get these kids. I was like, really? In Burma? Where are they? You know, they were in the woods. We ended up tagging along with people who knew them. We went with a documentarian who, who had talked with them. We went in search of them. They said, this is them. I mean, who knew who was who? We were in the woods. I mean, I was laying down in a canoe as they were, as they were rowing us through, like, through midnight, and you know, there were military guys all around us. These guys supposedly could take a small army, their tiny army, and defeat a huge army. I kind of think at the end of the day, it was probably more of a pipe dream than, than anything. But I think it was one of those, I think it was one of those kind of stories. And you guys, I have to tell you, I pinch myself all the time when, I, when I, I'm in my office at, at Rockefeller Center. Because when I graduated from college, I was so sure that I, you know, I knew I wanted to be a journalist, but I didn't know to do what. So I remember I had one job interview lined up, a single one. My mom lived in Alexandria. The job was in Richmond. 
I put on a new green suit. I had my hair blown out. I had a resume tape. I was like, I am getting that job. I get to Richmond. I look around the newsroom. I'm like, this is a beautiful newsroom. I am going to sit there, and I am going to date him. And my whole life, I already had my life worked out. The news director puts the tape in, plays it. He says, Hoda, I'm sorry, you're not ready for Richmond. And I thought, you know, that had not dawned on me. And I only had one interview. And he said, but, you know, wait, I got a buddy of mine who's hiring in Roanoke, Virginia, and he's going somewhere in the morning. But if you catch him tonight, I bet I'll hire you. And I said, will you please call him and tell him I'm coming? He said, I will tell him you're coming. So I was borrowing my mom's car, so I called my mom. I go, my mom goes, how was Richmond? I go, mom, I don't want Richmond. I want Roanoke. I mean, I got a job in Roanoke. I get to Roanoke. I look around the newsroom. I'm like, this is pretty good. I'll sit there. I'll date him. This will work out just fine, too. Okay? The guy puts my tape in the machine. He plays it. And he says, uh, Hoda, I'm sorry. You know, you're not ready for Roanoke. And I'm thinking, like, who in the hell's not ready for Roanoke? <laughs> Apparently me. So, um, Danny, may I hand you this? Can I hand you that water, if you wouldn't mind? Thanks. I'm afraid I'll knock it over. Um, so he says to me, okay, I'm not hiring, but there's a buddy of mine who's hiring in Memphis, Tennessee. And he's leaving tomorrow morning to go to the same conference I'm going to, but if you catch him, he'll hire you. I said, tell him I am coming. Now, Tennessee is the long, skinny state, and Memphis is at the other end. So I called my mom, and I said, Mom, I am going to Memphis. And my mom's a huge cheerleader. You know, you can do it. I was like, okay. I drove all the way across the great state of Tennessee. I meet the news director. My heart's pounding. I'm like, come on. He puts the tape in the machine. He plays it. He pops it out. He stops it. He says, Hoda. I'm sorry, you are not ready for Memphis. And I'm thinking, my God, what is wrong with this tape? What am I doing? And as I'm walking out, he says, wait, but I got a buddy of mine who's hiring. You guys, I was in the car driving around the whole southeastern United States for 10 days. 10 days I drove Birmingham. I was rejected ABC, NBC, CBS. Does anyone know where Dothan, Alabama is? I didn't think so. I got rejected from this tiny little town. <laughs> I was like, where am I? I got rejected through the panhandle. 27 news directors, 27 to my face, said no. So now my mom needed the car, and I needed to go home. So I was in the South, and I had James Taylor on, which was my sad go-to music. And I, <clears throat> I said, I'm bringing the car home. I'm, so, I'm going into PR. I blew it. Mistake. Whatever. So I start driving, and I get lost in Greenville, Mississippi. And there is a literal sign, a sign that says, Greenville, our eye is on you, CBS. I said, you know what? Let me go in there. I'm going to get rejected from WXVT, and then I'm going to get a map. That's what, that was my plan in my head. <laughs> so I go there, and this guy goes, hey, I'm the news director. My name's Stan Sandroni. I go, hi, Stan. I'm Hoda. Come on in, Hilda. I was like, whatever. <laughs> when you're getting rejected, who cares what your name is? Anyway, he puts the tape in the machine, you guys, and he's watching it. And my heart starts pounding. I am watching Stan watch my tape. I can't stop looking at him watching it. And he watches the whole terrible, awful 27 minutes. He stops it. He looks at me. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, Hoda, I like what I see. I was like, you do. I started crying. I was so tired. You know that feeling. And he said, <laughs> and so it, it taught me this. One, you only need one person, one person to like you. They told us at 30 Rock, bring someone in who changed your life. And I brought Stan Sandroni, and he came in there, hey, hey, Matt Lauer, hey! You know, he, but, it, but it only takes one, and I know, I know, you don't need 27. You don't need a room full. You need one to believe in you. And just to show you how much he believed in me, there was one day he came busting in the newsroom, and he goes, who has a blazer? I go, what? A blazer. Who brought a jacket? I said, oh, I have one. It's over there on the, in, on the hangar. I thought somebody needed it to shoot a stand-up. He goes, oh, good. You need to anchor the news. Anne is sick. I was like, okay. So the litmus test for who anchors the news is who shows up to work with a blazer. Okay, I'm always going to bring a blazer. That's all I could think of. So I had never done it before in my life. It's a single anchor show. I had that blazer on. I'm in front of the camera. It's two minutes till I'm like, please, God, please. This is my big break, okay? In the prompter, it says, good evening. I'm Hoda Kotby. Ann Martin is out sick. I'm like, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. So the guy cues me, and I go, good evening. I'm Ann Martin. I was like, oh, my God. You know when you're just like, you just want to start over? I was like, try. And I don't know about you, but when I mess up, I keep on messing up. It was 
the worst newscast, I think, in the history of the world. I was like I was on a toboggan, screaming down the mountain. I wanted it over. And when it was over, I looked around, and the floor director guy was like, hey. <laughs> nice. He took the mic off and, like, shook the cooties off it. And I went into the newsroom so I could get fired. And I, Stan wasn't there. And I'm like, oh, my God, he's not even here. So I said, well, I, I, I needed, so I got in the car, and I always go to the grocery store when I'm depressed to look for things to eat. So I went in search of ice cream and stuff, and I'm in the aisle, and this crazy-looking woman with, like, insane hair and just a few teeth came running up to me, and she goes, oh, my God, I just seen you on TV. I felt so sorry for you. I was like, oh, my God, like, that's it. I went to work the next day waiting for my pink slip, and I saw Stan. I was like, hey. He goes, well, that was awful, but and sick again, so why don't you give it one more go? I mean, one guy, Stan Sandroni, changed the course of my life. And so but if it weren't for Stan on that day, n Dateline wouldn't have happened, this wouldn't, nothing would have happened. So you never know when you're going to find your guy, your, your woman, the person in your path who's going to change it for you. And I think you'll see the same in this book. A lot of people have r ran smack into the person who changed their life. Anything else? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I like when the boys talk. My quotes, okay, I go to, I, I, every day on Twitter, I just take a quote from somewhere and just put it up as like, you know, just the quote of the day. Um, I, I follow a lot of those kind of quote things. There's something called something Proverbs. I follow that one, and I follow a few others. I just, I just search around, anything that moves me, you know, mostly on Twitter, though. I love that you're on Twitter. Okay, anyone else? Yes. Um, you know what I, <laughs> I've always wanted to do? I've always wanted to teach young kids. That's why when I was sitting next to you, I thought about that. I always wanted to teach little kids. Kids at the age where when you say, wave your arms in the air and swing like a tree, they don't go, I don't want to do that. When they're too young to think it's stupid, like that, I think that age. I always wanted to do that. So we're open some kind of a summer camp for kids to, to help them get a jump start. You know, I feel like a lot of kids who I meet are, should be rock stars and, and may not be because of their circumstances. So probably something like that. You guys, I cannot thank you enough for being so nice and warm, and made, you made me feel so good. So thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. <laughs>